Hi, thank you for joining the Spark Ranger Workshop. My name is Danielle Knappsmith. I'm a park ranger with the city of Austin and I help to run the Bark Ranger program. Bark Rangers is uh, meant to be completed with you and your dog. And our purpose through the program is to give you information about responsible recreational practices and to help educate others about our program and our recommended responsible recreational practices, which I'll go over in our workshop. Our goals are to reduce pet waste left on the ground, reduce off-leash offenses in our parks, so that's having your dog off-leash in an on-leash area, and to reduce injury that may occur to you and your pet as you enjoy nature. For this workshop, I'm going to go over some pet safety, pet equipment or gear, and leave no trace principles. In addition to our workshops, we have a service unit where our participants and their pets can volunteer in um, volunteer opportunities. They can also attend Bark Ranger events. Uh, but unfortunately, all in-person volunteer opportunities and events have been put on pause due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we do have an opportunity for our participants to volunteer on their own time. Uh, we have an incentive for participants who volunteer at least 30 hours. You get a service vest for your dog, and I have an example of one here. And they come in all kinds of sizes. So we have teeny tiny all the way up to extra large. Um, but this is earned after 30 hours of volunteer service. So normally, if this were an in-person um, workshop, you would come here with your pet. I would go over the workshop, we'd take a little hike together, and then you and your bark ranger would go home with a certificate and some swag. However, this is virtual, so I hope that your pet is close by as you watch this video. And we still want to give you credit for attending the virtual workshop today. So at the end of the workshop, I'm gonna ask you four questions and then to get credit, um, so that's your certificate and some swag, you'll email me the answers to those questions, provide your mailing address so I can send you your materials and let me know if you wanna join our service unit. Um, it's completely up to you if you want to join in, but you have to let us know so we can send you additional information about the volunteer opportunities. And I have an example of that swag that I'm talking about. So Remy here, he's our little mascot. He's showing off our Bark Ranger patch. And we also give out these bandanas for your dog. First, I'll cover pet safety. So water is the most important thing to bring with you on a hike for you and your pet. Texas is very hot, especially in the summertime. And we wanna make sure that you and your pet stay cool and hydrated. And I have an example here of some gear to use to keep your pet hydrated. I have a little bowl. This is collapsible, scrunchable, uh, and it has a little loop that you can attach to like a leash or a belt loop. And when you're ready to give your dog water, you simply unfold it, put water in there, and then you're ready to go. I also have a pet shower. So it might be hard to tell, but there are a bunch of little holes right here and you just attach it to um, like a plastic water bottle and it doesn't have any type of lid. So once you attach it and dump it, water's gonna come out, but it's a nice way to give your pet like a little shower, help them cool off with some water. And in addition to keeping your pet hydrated, you also wanna make sure that they're staying cool from the heat. Your dog might not be used to being outdoors. They might be more acclimated to a, a climate or an indoor climate with AC. So while you're at work, they're, they might be hanging out at home in your cool house or apartment, uh, and they might take a little extra time to get acclimated to the outside heat or the outside um, climate. So just keep that in mind when you're on a trip. And you wanna make sure to give your pet frequent breaks in the shades, let them rest and cool off. And you wanna look out for signs of heat illness or heat exhaustion. And symptoms of that for your dog might include heavy panting or labored panting, thick excessive drooling, gums that are pale or very red, uh, they might have diarrhea or maybe vomiting, and they might have lowered cognitive or slow cognitive functioning, so they might not come as quickly um, when you call out to them. So look for things like that, and if you notice any symptoms of heat illness, you need to evacuate immediately. Um, one thing to consider is that dogs pant as a way to cool down, so they don't sweat like we do, but they do sweat through their toe pads. So it might be helpful to keep uh, their paws wet. Or if you are hiking somewhere that has water nearby, 
you might want to let them um, get in the water you might want to uh, put some water on them just to keep their bodies a little bit cooler next I have a leash leash laws benefit all and the city of Austin's leash laws state that your pet needs to be on a leash that is a maximum of six feet. It can be shorter. Uh, they need to be on a leash at all times and under your control. And the only exception to this rule is if they're in a designated off-leash area, but they still need to be under your command or your control. Our parks are wild spaces and they're homes to wild plants and wild animals. And keeping your pet on a leash will help avoid any hazards that you may encounter on or off the trail. So examples of some poisonous plants include poison ivy, uh, stickers, burrs, cactus spines, anything pokey that could get into your dog's paw pads or any tender spots on their body. And your dog can't contract poison ivy, but the oils from the plant can stick to their fur and transfer to you if they rub up on you or you pet them. So you can contract poison ivy from your pet if they run across it. Some uh, hazardous animals that you may encounter in our parks include venomous snakes, biting or stinging insects, porcupines, or even coyotes. And I have an example here of some poor unfortunate pets that ran into a venomous snake. So we have an example here of a rattlesnake um, and all four of these pets were bitten in the face. So just like heat illness, uh, venomous snake bites can be fatal and this is something that needs immediate medical attention. So the best way to keep your pet on the trail is by using a leash. Next I have first aid. So it's important to carry a first aid kit with you for you and your pet and learn some safety precautions and treatment um, in regards to first aid. And um, first aid is for your pet is similar to first aid for a human with a few exceptions. So for example, band-aids don't stick to fur very well. Um, so instead of using those, you might want to use an elastic bandage or an ace wrap or even some gauze and tape. And for pet first aid, you can go very basic or you can go more advanced. So some basic items that you might want to include are wound cleansing, tweezers to maybe pull out some burrs or spines, anything sharp. Uh, you want some of those bandages, so not band-aids, but uh, bandages that are going to work for your pet. Some gauze pads, topical ointment, and a muzzle. And this one might be really important and something you haven't thought of before. So your pet may be very well-mannered and gentle, but when they're under stress or even in pain, they might have a tendency to bite. So having that muzzle in your kit might be really important. Uh, if you want to go more advanced than that, they make entire kits for pets. And I even have an example here of first aid for pets um, in, in a book. So you can get, just like human first aid, you can get very advanced with this. I'm gonna show you what's in this kit. There are some uh, gloves, an emergency blanket, tongue depressors, lots of gauze, these are uh, triangle bandages, so that's another example of a bandage that's not sticky but might be good for your pet. Ice pack, tweezers and scissors, um, some more like wound pads, there are some band-aids in here, maybe that's for you. Topical ointment and wound cleanse. So for my personal kits, I don't have a specific first aid kit for my pet. I just use um, the one that I would use for myself or for other humans. But when I have my dog with me, I make sure to throw in some of those items that are more specific to him. And I actually have three kits that I use. So I have a tiny kit, which I use when I'm just doing a short trip to the park. I have a small kit, which will be used for a day hike or maybe if I'm going to the green belt, somewhere that has rugged terrain where I might be more prone to injury. And then I have a large kit, which is actually a little bigger than this one. Um, and that I take on like multiple day trips or a camping trip. And like I said, if my dog's with me, I just make sure that I have like a muzzle and tweezers, anything that's not normally in my human first aid kit. And the most important um, thing to think about with first aid is knowing when it's time to evacuate or to leave. So you need to evacuate 
before an injury um, causes major harm or is fatal, something that needs immediate medical attention, you want to leave. And you want to have an evacuation plan for your dog. So my dog, for example, he's only 20 pounds. So it may be inconvenient for me to scoop him up and walk him out a few miles, but it's possible. If you have a larger dog or you're not physically capable of picking up your dog and walking them out, you might want to get a, uh, an emergency pet harness. So that could be like a backpack or some type of strapping system to harness them to you. That way both of you can get out safely. And I don't have an example of that here, but you can look them up online. Another point of evacuation is asking for help. So you can ask other uh, people on the trail for help. You can call, depending on the severity of the situation, you can call 311, Austin's um, helpline, or 911. And park rangers may be able to respond to your emergency depending on the severity in the situation. The next thing I have are some paw covers. So these are like little shoes or socks that you can use for your, to cover your pet's paws. And that might help them protect, be protected from cold ground, hot pavement, rugged terrain, any burrs or cactus spines, something sharp that would harm their paws. And I have two examples here. These are little kind of like balloon or latex covers uh, and they come in all different sizes. And these are more like socks. They're very thick. They have a hard rubbery bottom uh, and these might go up to like their little elbows. Um, so thinking about Texas and how hot it can get here, the air temperature is not a good indicator of the temperature of the ground. So for an example, at 77 degrees in the air, the temperature on the ground might reach up to 125 and an egg will fry on asphalt, I think around 130 degrees. So really not a good, uh, good indicator of how hot it might actually be for your pet's paws. If you um, are concerned about the temperature, you can test it by using the back of your hand placing it on the ground for eight seconds. And if it's too hot for you, it's gonna to be too hot for your pet. And that's where these little shoes or socks might come in, um, come in handy. Next, I have a PFD, a personal flotation device, life vest or life jacket. Um, and they're important for your dog to wear in the water just as they are for humans. There are several conditions which might make these necessary. So for example, if your pet is very energetic, uh, they like to swim a lot, they can get tired easily. And this might be important for them to fall back on. You can also have sudden changes in water conditions. So that could be water level or water flow. And if your pet is new to swimming or they're a weak swimmer, this also might help them feel a little more comfortable in the water. Um, this particular life jacket has a little flap to keep their head above the water. Not all life vests come with this, so if this is something uh, that you think would be important or necessary for your pet, just make sure you look out for that when you're, when you're looking at different brands. Um, and just like for a human, a proper fit is really important to ensure um, the success of a, a PFD. So you want to make sure that the fit is snug, not uncomfortable, but definitely snug, and you want to test the life vest after it has been wet and your dog's been wet. So to test that, you'll wanna take them to some slow, slow moving, shallow water, dunk them a bit, make sure both your pet and the vest get wet, and then test to make sure it's not gonna slip off in the water. The top causes of dog fatalities are accidental drownings and car accidents. Um, so having your pet secured in your car is really important. Seat belts for dogs are just as important as they are for humans. You don't want your pet loose in the car in case you get into an accident or you have to brake suddenly. They're gonna shift and move around in the vehicle and it can cause them serious harm or even a fatality. Um, so some examples I have here, this is a harness that is attached to a belt buckle. Uh, and this set came together, the harness and the strap. But if you already have a harness at home, you might be more interested in just buying this harness to seatbelt attachment. You can also get a crate that has some type of seatbelt attachment already included, or you can use a regular crate and use a series of straps or tethers that ultimately connect to a belt buckle. And this is the important part. Uh, this works just like a human seatbelt, and uh, in case of 
an accident or having to break suddenly, this isn't gonna come out. It's gonna stay secure and hopefully uh, keep your pet safe. If you are using a type of seat belt like this, you wanna make sure that you do attach it to a harness versus a collar. So the harness is gonna help, um, it's, it's around some of their stronger parts on their body, so like their chest and their shoulders, uh, and that's gonna be more comfortable for them versus a collar that's a very sensitive area and if they're moving suddenly in the car and the, um, the seatbelt's just attached to their collar, that could also cause harm or even a fatality. Next, I have a backpack. Um, this might be a fun item to include on your hikes, especially if you have an energetic dog or a working dog that needs a job. They can carry all of their gear or even yours on your trip. So things like treats, water, poop bags, leash, uh, any other items that are important for your hike. Um, but if you do use a backpack, just make sure that you don't overload them because they will get tired even more hot in the heat. So the next thing I have are poop bags and a poop holder. Don't forget to scoop the poop. In Austin alone, we have 250,000 dogs. They create 150,000 pounds of waste every day, which amounts to 55 million pounds of waste every year. And if all of that was left on the ground, that'd be very gross. Uh, pet waste that's left behind can lower the quality of our land and our soils, and it can wash into our waterways and lower the quality of our water. So for an example, pet waste uh, that has um, entered our water provides nutrients to that water and promotes algae growth and can even promote a toxic algae habitat. Uh, you might be familiar with the toxic algae outbreak we had last year in Lady Bird Lake. And some of that is caused by the nutrients um, from our pet's waste. Um, it can also be caused by human impacts and human pollution, but pet waste definitely plays a factor into our algae growth um, that we have every year. Pet waste can also um, reduce the amount of oxygen in our waterways, which will negatively impact the fish or aquatic wildlife that live in the water and it can also lower the quality of our, our waterways that we like to recreate in, or even fish in. So you don't want to swim in water that's gross and polluted, and you don't want to fish in water that's gross and polluted. Um, pet waste is also a host to lots of microbes, bacteria, and parasites, and they can negatively affect our health and our pet's health. And some of these microbes can live in our soil or our water from uh, months to even years and they can continuously contaminate uh, our land and our water. And some of these microbes include E. coli, salmonella, roundworm, giardia, that's just to name a few, there are lots of them. And like I said, we can contract those and so can our pets. So what can you do about reducing pet waste or pollution? You can pick up after your pet. So when your pet uses the bathroom, you simply grab a bag, scoop it up, tie it off, and then throw it away in a trash can. That's just as important as step one. I have some examples here of poop bags that have been left behind. So these owners did a really good job at picking up after their pet, at least scooping the poop, but they didn't, um, they didn't throw these away in a trash can. They missed step three. And these are some pictures that have come from our own parks, and you might have experienced this as well while you're on the trail. Um, waste that is left behind will uh, possibly enter our waterway. So this one's on a rock, guess where, uh, by the water. So guess where that's going later. And it can even cause double pollution because not only are you leaving your pet waste behind, you've also left a plastic bag behind. Um, and it's important to remember that there is no poop fairy. A dog owner is solely responsible for picking up after their pet and disposing of that waste properly. It's not the responsibility of park maintenance to come behind you and pick up after your pet. It's not the responsibility of park rangers to come behind you and pick up after your pet. It's your responsibility. Um, and all of that waste that's left behind, the only reason why it might disappear is because it has maybe washed into our waterways or it's flooded away, or a really nice park patron has come behind that person to pick up after them, but that's not normal. It's, uh, it's solely up to you, like I said, for you to pick up after your pet. And we really appreciate when you do. It helps to keep our parks much cleaner and our water and our land a lot cleaner.
That's all the examples I have for some pet gear. Next, I'm gonna talk about our Leave No Trace principles. The Leave No Trace organization is a nonprofit organization that provides innovative education, skills, and research to help people care for the outdoors better. They like to focus on educating people and helping them change their behaviors for the better versus um, something like habitat restoration. And if you wanna learn more information about that, you can go to their website at lnt.org. The Leave No Trace organization has created seven principles to help you minimize your impact while you're outside recreating. And we ask our park patrons to use them every time they visit our parks. Um, and these principles will help to ensure that our parks stay safe and clean and are preserved for generations to come. For the Bark Ranger program, we focus on five specific principles. And I have a chart here. If you're a more visual learner, I'll go through this. Um, so the first step is plan ahead and prepare. And planning ahead and preparing for your trip is going to ensure that your hike or your trip is the most successful it can be and that you're gonna be really happy. So if you, um, if you are ill-prepared or you don't have all the things that you need, you might not have a good time. So some things to consider are uh, planning out your trip ahead of time, so knowing where you're gonna go, um, maybe telling someone that's not coming with you where you're gonna be and when you plan to return in case of an emergency. You wanna look at the weather condition maybe the water level condition. If you're going to like the green belt, there might not be any water there. And then uh, you also wanna think of like whether any hazard uh, precautions that might be, that you might encounter while you're outside. And you also wanna make sure you have all of your gear for you and your pets. So your water, your leash, your poop bags, any other thing that's gonna be necessary to help you have a good time and stay safe. Next is travel on durable surfaces. So for you and your dog, this means stay on the trail and make sure your dog's on a leash so that they're on the trail. Remember there are uh, some hazards that you might encounter on or off the trail. It's mostly gonna be off the trail. That's, um, that's where a lot of our wild plants and animals live, is out of sight of you. And so making sure that you stay on the trail is important to help keep you and your pet safe. Um, we also want to avoid creating social trails, which can degrade our vegetation. Uh, it can destroy the plants. If we're continuously taking a social trail over and over, it will eventually widen, degrade our, um, our vegetation, and also cause habitat fragmentation. So that's a breaking up um, of our habitat, making it smaller. Um, so just stay on the trail with your dog uh, to avoid some of those concerns. You also want to dispose of your waste properly. So I just talked about this. Scooping the poop, making sure it ends up in that trash can and not just on the trail. And remember that pet waste is not a natural part of the ecosystem. It's not like a wild animal's pet waste. And um, when we have way too much of it on our ground, it can cause a lot of pollution for our land and water. Next is respect wildlife. So, you have to remember that you are visiting uh, an animal's home when you're in a park, because that's a wild space, that's where they live. So you wanna make sure that you're not getting too close to wildlife and you're not letting your dog get too close to them. So instead of approaching an animal, you might just wanna take a photo of it. Uh, and you want to try to suppress any harassment behaviors that your dog might display. So any chasing or barking or getting too close to them. Because uh, remember, you're visiting their home and they, your dog probably wouldn't appreciate if someone came into your home and started harassing them. Uh, again, making sure your pet's on a leash is the best way to keep them from chasing or harassing any animals. And if you have a small dog, you might want to uh, take some caution on coyotes. I mentioned earlier that we do have them in our parks. They're very well adapted to urban life and they are in our park system. Um, it's not very common for you to encounter a coyote on your hike or your walk, but you might. So if you do see a coyote and it's getting too close for your comfort, you want to pick up your dog, make sure you're holding on to them and they're not on the ground. And if the coyote continues to approach you, you wanna use a tactic that's called hazing. So you want to be loud or maybe look bigger than you are, um, shout at the coyote if there are items to throw towards it, like rocks, 
Uh, you can throw them towards the coyote, not directly at it, but towards it. You just really want to scare it off. Um, and if this happens to you, you can call 311 to report it. And like I said, it's not very common, um, but it's something that you just want to keep an eye out for you and your pet safety. And hazing is a tactic to retrain a coyote that you as a human are a predator and that you're some, something that they don't want to continuously encounter. And the last uh, principle is be considerate of other visitors or respect others while you're in the park system. We have lots of different visitors to our park system and they may visit for lots of different reasons or hobbies. That can include um, maybe just getting some peace and quiet, uh, escaping the, the city life, getting into nature for some, um, some forest bathing or just some quiet time. They might be watching animals or um, so bird watching or doing some photography. Uh, they might also just be interested in fitness or recreation or some type of other sport or hobby. Um, and so our, we want to make sure that our park system is inclusive for everyone and that everyone feels comfortable and safe in our park system. And visitors expect to see dogs on leash when they are in a park that has an on leash rule. Um, there might be different reasons for this. Some people might have a fear of pets or just generally don't want uh, dogs to approach them. They may have small children, and this is something that park rangers hear concerns of a lot, is uh, parents who are concerned for their small children that dogs may approach them or harm them. And people just generally might not want to be approached by an off-leash dog. So to accommodate for this, the city has 13 off-leash areas that are designated for your dog to roam and play um, off-leash. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, please try to use those areas uh, and all other uh, city parks make sure that when you're visiting your dog is on a leash just to make everyone feel comfortable and safe. Okay so that's all I have for the workshop. I'm going to ask you four questions. One is why is it important for you and your dog to stay on the trail? Two, name three types of gear to keep your pet safe. Three, Nay, uh, how many pounds of waste are created in Austin daily, not yearly, just daily? And four, name one way that you and your bark ranger can positively impact the Austin community. Make sure you email me your answers along with your mailing address and let us know if you want to join our service unit. Thanks for watching this workshop. We hope to see you in person soon.